I'm Robert Goble, and welcome to Pleasant Green. My grandmother once told me, always remember, you didn't grow up in Magna. You grew up in Pleasant Green. I often wondered what she had meant by that. I had learned from my grandmother that I was a descendant of Abraham Kuhn and Elizabeth Yarbrough Kuhn through their daughter, Frances Ann, and her husband, Lehi Nephi Hardman, original Pleasant Green pioneers. When a number of Abraham Kuhn's children began to settle in the shadow of Kuhn's Canyon in the Ochre Mountains, everything west of the Jordan River was simply known as West Jordan. Their little settlement became known as Kuhnville. Hardly a couple of miles north, at the point of the mountain, known as Millstone Point, many other pioneers were ranching and settling. A couple of decades would still pass, and a little town would begin to grow, until, on a hot, dusty Tuesday, July 21st, 1874 to be exact, Judge Elias Smith, presiding over the Salt Lake County Court, would establish the Pleasant Green Precinct which would take not only Coonville and Millstone Point, but all the farms and ranches from Black Rock around to North Jordan, known today as Kearns, and everything east to Granger. Hunter wouldn't split away until 1888. Pleasant Green was a full and vibrant community with flourishing farms known for abundant harvests in spite of the arid climate schools filled with children in the fall, wetlands and freshwater springs that had been known to Native Americans for thousands of years, stretched north to the Great Salt Lake, where sleighs would glide along the old Tooele Stagecoach Road, and children would gather to ice skate. The Pleasant Green Ward Chapel on the growing Main Street became the social center for town. A cemetery was established, and folks took comfort in knowing their loved ones would be laid to rest close to home instead of having to take them all the way to Salt Lake City. April and May would bring hills lush with wild flowers. The pure, sparkling water of Coons Creek sang with life. The name of our town itself told our story. So what happened? Plenty of myths have obscured the facts behind the Magna name. I remember asking a relative why the name had changed. He said Pleasant Grove and Pleasant Green's mail used to get mixed up. So some bigwigs in the post office flipped the coin and Pleasant Green lost. Another older gentleman told me, Daniel C. Jackling, president of the Utah Copper Company, wanted to name our town magma because copper comes from molten magma in the earth's crust and someone confused it for the latin word magna the more i took an interest in pleasant green's history the more i understood that these myths simply did not hold water the truth is daniel c jackling had a classical education especially a familiarity with Latin and Greek and classical history. His only intention was to name the operations on the hill in Pleasant Green, and had no intention of influencing the name of the town. Using the word magna, an adjective to describe a mill, is no accident. The word molina, 
is the singular feminine nominative of the Latin word mill. In the mind of someone who is classically educated, overlooking the greatest milling operation in the world at that time, he would think Molina Magna. It is the Magna Mill. The good folks of Pleasant Green, for generations, have had the strange tradition of naming their post offices after something other than the town, but it's not always their fault. Take Frank Chambers, for instance. His farm was at a good central location between Coonville and Millstone Point. The stagecoach would drop off the mail at his place, Chambers Station, and folks would come pick it up. If a letter didn't happen to be left at a post office in Salt Lake, and then your name be printed in the paper to notify you, a letter was waiting for you. The feds didn't care what Salt Lake County called the location. They simply put Chambers' name by a little dot on the map where Pleasant Green should have been. Forward to 1889, when Alexander Adamson became postmaster. He was sensitive to the heritage and history of Pleasant Green and felt William Wollerton Reiter, who had helped run cattle around Millstone Point and had owned property near Joseph Toronto, James Bertosh, and Daniel Spencer, only to become a banking and railroad magnate. Adamson petitioned the Postmaster General in Washington, D.C. to have the name of the post office changed to Writer, October 5th, 1888. The post office at that time was at Chambers Station. The form he filled out gave the establishment of a post office at Pleasant Green, not Writer. Jacob Reed in 1902 and Samuel Spencer in 1903 did the same. Enter Reynold Woolley. At the time he became postmaster in 1914, the Magna Mill had been on the hill above Pleasant Green proper for eight years. During those eight years, a phenomenon had grown out of the excitement of living by a famous landmark. Folks owning businesses in Pleasant Green were caught up in the rage of naming their businesses after the landmark on the hill, the Magna Barber Shop, or the Magna Lumber and Feed Store. Woolley wanted to get into the act. In his questionnaire to the Postmaster General of Washington, D.C., the following question was asked. The name proposed for the post office is, Woolley wrote, Magna. The questionnaire then asked, if the town, village, or site of the post office be known by another name than that of the post office, state that other name here. Woolley wrote, Pleasant Green. Bingo. In one simple answer, Wally dispels all future myths and the clouds of confusion on what really happened on that day of February 11th, 1914, disappear. He had no intention of influencing the name of Pleasant Green. He was only doing what previous postmasters in Pleasant Green had done. The name of his little post office was in honor of the world-famous landmark on the hill and not the name of his town. But wait, what happened next? It's obvious. That little unincorporated corner of Salt Lake Valley was suddenly inundated with a tsunami of newcomers who had no inkling of our heritage or history. They came for work. Can you blame the fellow worker? Riding home to answer his family when they ask, where do you live? He looks at the stamp on his letters and answers, Magna, the indifferent and lazy county who had no stake in the history and heritage of Pleasant Green, simply went along with it. There was no meeting of powerful men to decide a change in our name, no vote, no pomp and circumstance, and simply no memory of Judge Elias Smith's county court of 1874, who had established Pleasant Green. They just went along with the flow for decades. By the 1930s and 1940s, well after the Salt Lake Herald had folded, the other newspapers, I can't blame the snaring Salt Lake Tribune, but shame on you, Deseret News, went along with it too. It was easier to call Pleasant Green Magna than to try to continue to differentiate between all the new neighborhoods 
company housing like Ragtown, and company towns like Garfield, and try to see them all as Pleasant Green, which they still were. It was a change in identity, a nickname in the minds of a new generation, but not in the hearts of the posterity of the original pioneers. <laughs>